dying to get out of here. <laughs> um, now I get to remember how to do this. I think I, yeah, so that you don't, know, I think you made me host, right? Yep, there you go. So you should be host now. Okay. All Sounds right. Good. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, so I think the goal for today is, and I, I, I have to tell you that I was, I was really sick for two weeks straight where I couldn't even, I don't, I had a bad cold, so I haven't done as, as much work as I've wanted to, but, um, I didn't want to cancel the meeting because I feel like we, we, we need momentum and, um, there'll be times when some people have more time than others. So, um, but I just wanted to, and, and Stephen, I missed, so I missed the, the, the CAPC meeting because that, because I was really ill. Um, so I don't know if anyone was able to attend. Um, I know it wasn't the groups, but I don't know if anyone heard it or anything. I, I'll give an update on it. Stephen called me and, and I just haven't had a chance to call him back. So I'll, I'll give everyone an update from what, what he told us next, next steps are. But I think the, the goal for this meeting, and I'll take meeting notes, um, just because we have to for all of these public meetings and in general, it's good for us to keep track, um, is uh, the goal for us is to come up with action items that, that we agree on um, that, that are kind of, that, that are things that we, that we want to see happen. Um, and, uh, so I don't know if anyone has any updates right now, or if we should just, or thoughts, or if we should just start, um, going through and, and, and discussing what, what we think is, is important. I just sent you something also that Hank had sent me, um, from the town of Concord, that it was related to MBTA communities, the zoning compliance guidelines and how they're looking at it, which I think is super helpful to even send to Jean. Um, oh, okay. And um, again, I, I haven't looked at it as closely, but I thought that it was um, that, sorry, that train, um, that, that in general, it had um, some information that also affected the CAPC. So it's something that I think we should take a look at. Um, and Oscar, I made the, the MAPC folder and I put it in the Google Docs. Does everyone have access to the Google Docs? Yes. Or do you want me to send that? Okay. So I, I put that yes, in yes. there. Yeah, we just, I just couldn't upload stuff. So I think Let access was okay. Thank you for doing that. Um, and so any information, you know, that we have, so I've been sending everyone the meeting minutes, but I think, um, I'm gonna, so do we want to go around and, and just basically give any updates and then jump into what, what goals? Well, you, do you want to give us your updates? I didn't see, I didn't attend the CAPSI meeting with, with... I, I, no, I did. I don't have them. I need to oh, talk you don't to have it. Okay. No. So you need to talk to Stephen. Okay. No, so I what I'll do is once I talk to him, I'll send out an email to give everyone updates. Okay. Did, uh, and Dave, I, can, you... I can also watch it. I just haven't I haven't had time to do any of it, but I didn't want to cancel this because I felt like at least if we touch base, it gives us momentum to keep on going, especially with the holiday season coming. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Dave, did I don't know if you attended or if you want to talk about that or if you have other thoughts you want to talk about. I'll just I was gonna, I know you gave us homework to maybe give us some everybody to think about what we think would be our five items. Um, mm -hmm. I have four, <laughs> but I, I was just quickly draw, drawing these down to, and I think based on our conversations last meeting and some of the work, I've, just the research I've done, I think one of the keys is, is trying to create and amend our zoning bylaws to expedite ground mounted and rooftop solar system installation. And I think, I mean, Dave, you'll know more about whether, you know, what we would need to go through and what we have thought about or you've thought about to implement, um, what would be the issues that we would wanna deal with. But I think that that comes out of all this reading and the understanding from what the recommendations are from other towns, that seems like a low hanging fruit. Let's just try and find a way to streamline installation of solar systems whether the, and that's a combination of resi and also for the municipality and for commercial um and then the permitting process related to that 
improving it, streamlining it. Maybe we get a website, maybe we have online sign in, maybe we create some incentives in the permitting fee structure, maybe we remove the fees, reduce the fees for solar installation or solar system installation. So they're kind of together, but um, I, all of that is promoting the ease of installation of <laughs> solar, solar systems across the town. I think that's what everybody, that's one area that seems like an area that we could oh, attack. It sounds like there's two. There's the amend zoning for groundwater. Um, ground mounted, yeah. For Oh, ground mounted, not groundwater. Ground mounted and rooftop. Ground mounted and rooftop solar, okay. Yeah, so there's probably two paragraphs that relate to the two different things because some requires more land area. Others would be maybe on their housing or on the building. So yeah. there are two different aspects of that. And we talked a little bit about that last week about municipal lots where we might be able to do that. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of this is what is thought about by targeting areas where this could work in town on publicly owned land for ground mounted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's not typically a residential option, but the rooftop is something that could be um, considered. And I don't, I don't honestly know, Dave, what, what, we're, what we have in our bylaws right now for being able to do that as a resident. Um, you know, if that's an easy lift or if it's challenging. And then the, there's systems related to that, like if you have a ground source or a air source heat pump system that's in your setbacks, that's another piece of this, right? right? So that you wanted to be able to allow that to happen within the setbacks. And so to make that easy, maybe that's something that Dave can can review and, and approve without having any other oversight. So it's pretty simple, um, uh, part of the bylaw. Um, anyway, those that's part of it. And yes, then the permitting aspect of doing these, um, just making it easy to do it. And there were suggestions about some towns are setting up websites and they're setting up online permitting process so that it's really simple and fast and, um, so we're just streamlining and making less less uh, friction for those kinds of things to happen. That's and what about in just not just well, think, but also incentives. What about incentives? Right. Well, permit fees maybe um, was one area that they've, people have thought about where you could recommend uh, reducing the fee uh, or removing the fee for if you if you're doing um, solar installation and systems installations. Um, there may be other incentives. That's sorry, Lee. We, I cut you off. Well, I was just going to say. So it sounds, uh, um, Oscar, like like you're really talking about defining what the ground mounted systems are, what the solar systems are, creating definitions, then deciding which of those um, um, technologies should be by right and in what context and what district, um, and um, whether there are setback constraints to their placement in setback areas. Um, um, yeah. yeah, so it's really, it's kind of defining what are those things we're going to be allowing and then in what, in where does it make sense to allow it by right and under what context and modifying the zoning to do that. And then it's, um, I guess, uh, yes. So, so, so Dave, I, I guess it's kind of a sense of understanding for me, it's a question of understanding what those systems are, um, where it makes sense to allow it by right, and what are our current constraints in our zoning that aren't enabling it to happen. I mean, are there requirements in terms of our of height that needs to be adjusted? Are there um, changes in definitions of what is considered a, a, a structure on the roof that needs to be exempted out from height? Is it a problem with these things being placed in setbacks where we don't define our the accessory structure to include them? I mean, yes, I agree with Oscar that that's a very important component to do. Uh, to do, I just don't think I have a clear sense of exactly what needs to be modified to make to enable it. So, residentially, we don't really have any issues with with the zoning as the way it sits. Um, most of our our approvals for solar installations right now are rooftop solar installations, which they, they only sit off the roof by six or eight inches. So, you know, it's not a height issue. Um, okay. 
There's, there's no accessory structure that goes along with them because they usually either attached to the side of the building or the battery units are inside the garage. We've had only maybe one or two ground mounted solar systems. I mean, uh, yeah, solar systems that were basically mounted on a single post that may have had six or eight panels. Um, it's, and the answer is, is that uh, we just don't, the lots aren't big enough to, to be worried about, you know, ground mounted systems. Even if we are, I treat them, uh, I treat them as accessory structures. So, okay. you know, you know, if they're over 15 feet in height, we, we have them maintain the side setback of that district. If they're not, then it's, you know, five and five, like, like we normally do. Okay. Um, so that hasn't been a problem. The problem is going to be is when we get into the commercial part of it is, you know, if we just start talking about uh, parking lot covers with solar installations and on top of those is that, you know, are we going to treat them like accessory structures and then what are the setbacks going to be? Um, you know, are we going to waive coverage requirements or do we still consider them coverage? Um, they probably have to be know. exempted out of FAR and gross floor area and all that. Yep, all of that. And then oh. some of the commercial applications where, you know, I can see like, you know, we're going to be putting one on that parking garage on, on, on Kendrick. That actually meet, you know, it was under the height requirement. But let's say we wanted to put one on top of the TripAdvisor garage. That's going to be a problem because that's going to be another probably 15, 16 feet higher than that garage is. It right. certainly makes makes sense to put it on there, but under our current zoning, I don't think I don't think we could. So if we treated it more like um, the accessory structures or non-habitable structures up that go above the roof line that we have exemptions for in the zoning. So we'd have to think about whether we would allow something like this to be considered an exempted structure, right? Like towers, bell towers, clock towers, stuff like that are, are often given height uh, exceptions, right? Correct. So maybe this is something we could consider. Um, and again, I think, how do you balance making it easy, incentivizing it to happen, and then also having the ability to review it as a, not necessarily as a special permit, but as a major project review, or so there's some plan review, site plan review or something, so that there's some input on whether we need to set it back, or, um, you know, is there a, an orientation that we would be concerned about, or you know, something maybe there may be details that we could discuss with the particular application of that as a as a because they work both as solar and as as a shading or a protection um for cars that are parked on the roof too so there are some benefits not as much in our climate as they are in the south where they love to have the shade you know to keep cars from baking um so yeah, I know it's it's probably going to be an issue for um, the Muzzy site too. Yeah, so you know, residentially, you know, you mentioned permit wise before, so we are, we're all online permits right now. Um, I issue probably a half a dozen solar permits a week, and they are not in the queue for probably as long as they submit most all the information that we're we're asking. And, and they usually do because there's only two or three solar co companies out there that are actively applying for permits is that they'll get their permit within a day or two. The cost of the permits, you know, let's say based on $80,000, which is a high solar permit, um, it's $10 per thousand. So it's 800 bucks for that permit. So, you know, it's not, you're not breaking the back of anybody uh, yeah. doing these things. Uh, we still have to cover our costs we couldn't waive the costs totally, but I still have a wire inspector that goes out. I have a building inspector that goes out. We need to cover those costs and, and the clerical part of it. So, so you think that your fee right now is doing that for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, do you think yeah. there's wiggle room to give them some discount or no? That's up. I think you, can, you don't have to answer, I, but yes. I think, they're, I think they're residentially, no. Yeah. Commercially, yes. You know, because that one on Kenwood, that 
you know, that potentially could be, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars in, you know, installation, maybe a couple hundred thousand because it's actually a structure. So in that case, you know, maybe we could talk about, you know, some sort of a reduction in fees or something for the big commercial ones. Yeah. So that may, that's how we do it. We just have a residential fee structure and a commercial fee structure or something. Yeah. Do you have yeah. separate fee structures now? You probably do. No. No, okay. they're all they're all the same right across the board. Everything, $10 per thousand, residential and commercial. So we could look at that. Okay. Yep. Yep. So there are different fee structures. Let me just, I'm writing this here. Um, yeah, that was interesting. There was a little bit on the on the tax rates and it was interesting to note that um, Wellesley has the same tax rate for their commercial and their residential um, land. And I guess we're going through that, setting our new tax rates next week, right? Dave, you probably know about that. I don't know what we are. Are we, the, are we, we're not equal, I guess. So we have a higher rate for commercial property than residential property, I assume, because that's pretty yes, typical. Yes, we have a split rate. Yeah, but I was curious. Did you know that Wellesley was the same? We're getting off track here, but yes, I thought I was curious to hear. That. I didn't. I didn't know Wellesley was the same, but I heard that Wellesley was uh, was ex it was expensive. It's one of the more expensive towns around as far as taxes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I have here just as the first as the first thing, which I I, I guess I. I I agree. I think this is like a low hanging fruit, this whole roof, the solar, the ground mounted and the rooftop solar installation. Does anyone disagree with that? As no, I think that's, I think that's an important one to do and to review yeah. the zoning to see what barriers are out there and, and make the necessary adjustments. Yeah. And I think, as you said, Lee um, and Dave, I think we'd, we'd want to make sure we actually look at all the public opportunity, public land opportunities, because I think you, you really are dialing this in. You're not you're not doing anything. That's a different with... thing, though. One is to modify the zoning for installation. That, that would that be number two? Then would no. Be... It's part of the first piece. The, the ground mounted. I think you pull them apart. The ground mounted is, as Dave said, there's basically nobody residentially that's going to want to do that because the lots are small. Maybe right. I'm not saying that that's a no, but it's it's more challenging. Maybe multifamily. Maybe. But typically the residential's roof mounted, I would think. But Dave would, can correct me. But on the ground mounted, that that to me is the commercial. It's the municipal areas where that's the that there's potential there um, for for doing a ground mounted. Um, and I think in those cases, for all the municipal land we would own, we would want to go through and and as we did last you know last meeting, we were going through and looking at the Defazio and and the high school and and. Newman and there are a bunch of you know half dozen sites across town that we could look at. So we're not necessarily yes, writing yes. the zoning. We're really targeting the zoning for areas that we think on municipal land or larger commercial land. Um, so we we go into it eyes open, basically. That's all I'm saying. We'd have to do more research on on the well, opportunities. As I as I understand that you're saying you want to understand what the opportunities are to make sure that zoning is crafted in a way that it enables the goals and objectives that, that you uh, want to accomplish. Yeah, we is streamline it. So yeah, we know we know basically that we can do ground mounted and we and we and we think about where where it can best go. Um, so but, I'm writing here, modify zoning for ground mounted and rooftop solar installation on zone, um, sorry, for, for municipal, commercial municipal buildings, um, review opportunity of sites, right, ease of permitting online, and creating different fee structures. Well, that's, yeah, that's the second piece, yeah, the whole. Well, create permitting. definition setbacks and by right locations. So, um, so I mean, I could, I could, I could do this, right? Review opportunities of sites, ease of permitting, and on, and creating different fee structures. We'll need to. I mean, I, I just this is what Lee had said. We'll need to create. Can everyone see this, or is it too small? Nope. Um, yeah, review we, opportunities. Yeah. We'll need to create definition setbacks and by right locations. Does that seem right? right? 
So the other part of this is what sort of a process commercially are they going to have to go through to, to do this? Is this going to be a planning board action? Is this a special permit action? Is it all by right? They don't go to the planning board. I think that's um, that's the conversation, really. That's that's yeah, the, that's, the policy, that's that's the policy choice. How much control do you want over the installation of these solar panels over parking lots? Right. So it's it's a it, maybe it's a by right with a site plan review. Well, site so plan it's, review itself triggers a special permit. You see the way, well, we have to maybe think about a different kind of site plan approval process because right now Needham's site plan approval process is a special permit. It's um, it, it, it's processed under under 40A. It's, a, yeah. it's basically, it's, it's, called, it's, it's called a special permit, but it's a limited special permit. And it just follows the protocol of a 40A special permit in terms of, this, in terms of the timelines and the process. So we so don't have do, this really short ad, administrative site plan approval process that's done administratively. But if you have currently in our right, zoning, right? Okay, so that's one something to think about whether we do something that is a little bit more streamlined, less less onerous. Um, well, so I'm just I, I was, thinking the planning board process gets a little cumbersome sometimes, and I'm not taking anything away from the planning board. It's just that. Hey, Dave, what are you one, trying to say? I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> once, once, once their plate is full, it's full, and they're on to the next meeting. So if the applicant has to wait another 30 days to get before the planning board, um, if we can do it with, you know, within uh, in-house with, with staff approval, as opposed to the planning board approval, at least at some level, maybe you cut it off, um, is that it just speeds up the process. Because it goes to the planning board, okay, the, the one meeting, they approve it and all that. And then three weeks later is a decision issued. And then three weeks later, it's recorded. And all of a sudden we're, you know, a month and a half later, where we're able to issue a permit. Where if they had all their ducks in a row and it, made, and it met some sort of special criteria that we have, then it's in-house approval approved within a few days. Yeah, and it could be, yeah, so if, if we could do that, then it could be processed really just straight through the building department right. as, a, building. As, a, as, as a building permit. Right, building, engineering, or whoever needs to get involved with it. Now, the second half of that is we want to be able to try to be a little greedy here is that with these ground-mounted solar systems, I'm talking about the canopy ones, um, if we can do something with the stormwater that comes off of these, that's even a win-win for, for us as well, because now we're taking clean uh, stormwater and recharging it into the ground. So it's another thing to think about. We have a stormwater bylaw right now, which we have people um, install systems for new homes, new buildings, and additions over a certain size. Um, we got the people on Kendrick Street to, um, with a little push, got them to recharge at least um, a percentage of their water. They didn't meet the stormwater bylaw, but they 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 got about halfway there, which is good. Um, so that's another another thing to think about. So we could say, following your that comment, that there there's a way that we could conceivably write a a bylaw that would be targeted to installation with stormwater implications with with responding to stormwater needs and and have setbacks and screening and other other um other information in there that's specifically creating the guidelines so that you feel in a meeting until like you feel you're addressing i think dave it's, it would be you guys telling us or, or helping us draft what those guidelines are so you're basically spoon feeding to yourself what you want to see right right so, and and of course you know the the in-house approval can be for um existing sites uh where you know new sites are going to go to the planning board anyway and then you know we would hope in the future that under the new sites that go to the planning board that solar is going to be a part of it it's going to be an everyday thing now that they they included as part of their site plan approval. Is it yeah. just for is is it just for um, do we want to say that it's just for 
the solar um, or is it also for heat pumps and, and for solar rooftop? systems, solar systems, right? Isn't that, isn't that what people are using as the, that captures uh, anything that would be ground mounted, that would be part of the overall system of supporting not only solar collection, but solar or, or, or heat pump or energy efficiency systems. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we add that you know, solar and other energy efficiency right. systems. I'm, I'm yeah, just I looking like at the conversation from last time as, as just some of the recommendations, which ones do we think that, you know, as a starting point, um, this being the solar being one of them, but Lee had mentioned that, you know, um, Wellesley, yep. they're looking at strategies without zoning barriers, exemptions of height and setbacks for solar and heat pumps. So yep. I just want to make sure that, um, that when we do, these are two separate items. One is for commercial and municipal buildings, which have opportunities of sites versus modifying zoning for rooftop. And we can wordsmith this also in a second, but I just wanna make sure that we're, it's 1.30. I wanna make sure that at least we like hit the five points that we think are the most critical and then we'll, we can wordsmith it. Yep. Okay. Does that seem good? <clears throat> so this is, I just took what other people had said before. You, you, you talked about stormwater also, and I added um, review stormwater bylaw for, for recharging. Yep. Yeah. Yep. David, you're going to be proud that I brought this up at our planning board meeting, at the last planning board meeting, saying that this is something important that you had brought up that I think we need to review. So FYI, or some meeting, I don't know what meeting, some meeting <laughs> I brought it up. So we're we're listening. No, it was the planning board. I heard it. Yeah, you brought it up. That, that, that was at the 4050 um Central Ave meeting. Yeah. The first no, that, that, that's great because uh we've been advocating for the stormwater thing for, for years. And sooner or later, you know, these towns that haven't done anything with stormwater are gonna be up against it because the the federal regulations are going to eat them up and they're going to end up getting fined if they're not um, actively involved with stormwater uh, recharge. Yeah, I, I think this is why it's actually this group, I think, is super important because we're we're kind of sharing information that is beneficial in the long term for the whole town on many different levels. And I think that it's hard to get us all together. And sometimes we're just, you know, talking past each other and we don't even know what the different groups are doing. I think that these, um, the housing plan and the CAPC and creating this opportunity for us to even share this information is, should be done more often to tell you the truth. And the next so. thing is the Charles River watershed that's coming because the, right. the predictions for what the, you know, how water is going to be rising and the frequency of storms and the severity of storms, that whole... <laughs> area along the Charles is going to become <laughs> challenging. To, we'll have to think about that for, are we going to be right. lifting finished floor levels and all that stuff? There's a lot of challenges ahead, but that's down the road too. So that was one of the things I looked at. One of the towns that I looked at was Westwood when we were talking about this. And Westwood kind of took an all comprehensive look at the whole climate change deal um, the, the rising, you know, river, you know, elevations. Um, so they, they kind of came up with this master plan that covers everything we were just talking about, not just, you know, solar or whatever. It was pretty interesting that they kind of captured all of that in, in a uh, document. We should be doing that, right? I mean, so I guess the question the is, the question, yeah. okay, so that's the, yeah. let me tell you what's on the list that we should discuss. But one of the things that Lee had mentioned is to create a climate overlay district with high performance standards. Planning board to amend rules and regulations for applications with information on resilience, environmental, transportation, and equitable participation narrative. So this is creating an overlay district. Can, what we, I'm just, hearing from can we just say that that's town wide because I don't think we want to do this other than, or, or we need to make sure that we're covering everything. Right, because we well, know the question is also the uh, townwide master plan. Yes, well, that's part. Yes, but I'm saying when that's we're separate overlay... from the, the overlay district. Um, uh, and I'm so trying, we... just trying to think, right, because there's a master plan, which is kind of what this climate action plan. Well, no, the climate action plan is just to create a plan. The mat, a townwide master plan. Is um, an implementation of, of climate related strategies that affect 
yeah, zoning, building, planning, whatever. But I would say in the climate overlay district, and I want to just make sure I understand what Lee means. If if because I we were talking about having if you can't do it in pieces because we're trying to I keep thinking about MPTA where they're saying you can't have something that applies just to the MPTA districts for sustainability and climate, you know, climate, you know, environmental uh, standards, it's got to be town wide. So whatever we're doing, I think we have to keep thinking about this has got to be town wide. It may be chapters for commercial and residential, but it's got to be something. Either that, that or, have... well, either that or maybe you exempt out that the residential piece from the requirement, which is, I think what Cambridge does. Cambridge but, requires some standards, higher standards on the commercial side, and they just basically don't apply those higher standards to the affordable housing. So well, creative want, climate right? instead of an overlay I, you know, district. But you know, our, you know, Oscar, I, I threw out the idea of a, of a climate overlay district. I'm not, I'm not wedded to that, nor am I convinced that that's really the appropriate strategy. Right, um, right. I was laying, I was, I think I was just expressing that as an option um, because it does have those constraints and, I, and maybe we're better suited um, currently to kind of follow more of the approach that you're talking about, which is to, you know, look at the ground mount of the solar and um, strategies to get out of the way so that those technologies are implemented. Um, and then maybe look on the commercial side, you know, about of, of reporting requirements in terms of how people are actually uh, providing uh, resi resilience in their design in terms of flood and heat and just overall building design. I, right. So I guess I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I didn't mean to give the impression that I was advocating or recommending um, um, that strategy. Strategy. Yeah. Okay. So maybe it's not an overlay zone, but it's townwide master plan for climate strategies, right? Yes. Create, because we need to have create townwide um planning board to amend rules and regulations for applications with information on resilience environmental transportation and equitable participation narrative yep is there that something now is that a second that, thing but the well, first one is is creating um strategies for um commercial and um, municipal versus um municipal and residential right right I think the, one of the key things here, I know this is on Dave's list, we need to amend and adopt the stretch code, the latest stretch code, right? And we got to set our bar for um, the energy efficiency building standards, construction, faster adoption of all electric energy systems for you know new construction, renovation. Um, and I think that's got to apply in various ways to our commercial or municipal and our residential, both single family and multifamily. So it's, it's basically buying into amending, adopting the latest standards so that we're on the forefront of, of setting the bar for our construction of energy efficiency, um, you know, environmental stewardship, all of that. You know, it's, it's basically building envelope systems, going for all electric as opposed to electric ready. I mean, that's kind of where the discussion, the debate is, are you going to allow builders to build? Or are you going to just cut the gas off and not let anybody use gas anymore? I mean, there's some things we have to think through the implications, the pros and cons, but basically getting the, I think part of this chapter or part of the master plan is also the building codes. Setting right. Bar. So so Steve asked me if I wanted to attend that meeting to talk about, you know, the uh, the new stretch code and you know the zero net energy uh, yep. code that may be out. The problem is that even even us we we don't know what's on the table right this right this second. Uh, they're talking about the stretch energy code going into effect January first, and we we've only seen drafts of that. I think the stretch energy code is probably, you know, that's that's not going to be a big deal. The the zero net energy, yeah. the net um, zero is a, that's it high. Yeah, that that is a different animal altogether. And I can tell you that the BBRS and DOER right now are fighting back and forth about they those code, those code requirements big time. Um, and like I said to Steve, I said, you know, if the electric bills go up 
like they're talking about going up over this winter. And for some reason, this was going to town meeting in the spring. This thing would get on in flames because it's all about going to electric. I mean, people aren't stupid. They, they realize what's going on. So um, I think that final draft of that's going to be two years out. So what do we do in the meantime, Dave? So we're, we're kind of on the edge of preparing the, the town meeting discussion for that two year out change, right? I think, do we do something like the electric ready? Do we start thinking about how we can do a transitional bar that's not gonna you know, make Needham you know, stupidly hard to do stuff, but at least yeah. we're on the books as heading in the right direction. And so it's a stretch code comb combined with maybe new construction, there'd, there'd be incentives for going all electric, right? Give them a reduction on the fee or maybe no fee, right? I mean, let's yep. be, let's test some stuff, right? I mean, we're, we tend to be a town that waits for everything to get tested in other towns and then we then we take action. But yeah, I think- we're, we're kind we're, of shy, gun shy. But I think our climate action team is freaking awesome. And and we're making decisions about um, you know, doing the, um, negotiating with the power companies for you know getting started on that process the DEA or whatever that was or EA, I forget what the acronym <laughs> too many acronyms but I just I mean I'd love to think and it sounds like you're pretty plugged into this too Dave so your thoughts on how we might create a transitional set of standards for the town that that works but you know sends the message I think it would be cool I'd love to work on that well I think I think the the new stretch energy code requirements are going to do a lot of what you're talking about. Um, yeah. the, I think what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to they're going to up the bar with the stretch energy code a little bit. They're going to ask for more requirements under that, and I think by doing that, it's going to kind of ease into the zero net energy. Um, approval a little, a little easier because we're going to already be halfway there we're already doing a lot of the stuff that you know uh people are talking about that it's already under the energy code but they're gonna you know they're gonna tighten it up and uh there's no doubt about it that that they're forcing the whole construction energy you know industry is to go into electric and that's great uh and we're probably going to be there someday um but it's going to take 25 years to implement that, I, I think. But I do like the idea that if we have incentives, we have some creative builders who want to come in and, and see that Needham's giving them a free free permit if they go in on go all electric. Hey, you know, is there a is that a downside? Is there any downside to that? To for us, I mean, the fees are the fees. Um, so maybe there's a reduction, not a removal, but. Sending a message that Needham's a town that's going for this, and we're going to incentivize builders. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on whether you have those conversations with builders that would have given you any indication that there are guys out there that are, want to do, you know, get more aggressive and, um, and look to see the town respond to I mean, that. Problem. I mean, their their idea about being aggressive sometimes is they ended up putting, you know um uh electric car charger in the garage <laughs> you know yeah. they they you know these these everybody thinks these houses are getting built in town that the, the builders are making millions of dollars it's not the case so um it's all all depends is that you know and i agree and i think if solar panels were on a roof when the house was you know when when the applicant bought the house um you know, it's a great, great addition to it. Some people don't like the looks of them, so they may not buy the house because they're on there. Um, right. It's, uh, you know, it's an extra cost of, you know, eighty, ninety thousand dollars on the builder, you know, and some pre-wiring, maybe an extra hundred grand. Can he get an extra hundred grand for the house? Probably. Um, you know, and it's a contractual issue between the builder and the installation of the solar panels and if that is going to be transferred over to the new the new owner right. by the building right um so uh, i think it's going to end up being that that way at some point anyway and you um, said yeah you thought you'd start to see buildings changing their roof lines and and being more aware of you know 
doing things without as much kind of conflict with what could be a panel installation. Dormers. Well, they, yeah, I mean, if they have to comply with all electric and they need to maximize the roof, the roof to put as many panels on as they can, there's no way that the design can stay the way it is. Right. It's got to change. Right. Um, and then orientation of the buildings on the lots may change a little bit. We yeah. can't do that too much because yeah. the lots are so small and the houses are so big, you can only move them a little bit. So um, well, I think there's a question here that I have. Talk about that too. That's so I, I wrote a couple yeah. of things that we talked about last time here, which is coordinate this work with MBTA communities. I think that's a critical piece. We don't want to you know, hurt one or the other. We want to work with them together. And I think that that's something that um, yep. has to happen. So the ones that, that we also talked about was we, we, you, Oscar, you talked about the MAPC. And so is there anything related to that that isn't covered up, up here already? Well, I mean, there's, <laughs> they cover, I mean, one of their top issues is the equity impacts, right? That's MAPC is huge on making right. sure that we're equitable. So the, the challenge is on the equity side is the costs to, to the consumer, to um, the multifamily uh, developer, the, the pass on costs, if they're going to be being aggressive on their, on their construction. So is there, is there a way that we make sure that we're keeping an eye on the equity um, component when we're looking for, you'd like to think that being energy efficient is also still equitable. It's not, it's not going to create in, in, an imbalance so that you, know, right. you can't accomplish the same goals for, and, and I think some of that's going to be really interesting to see with NHA, you know, that are they going to be able to deliver in their renovation project, um, the preservation and reservation project uh, or PRI or whatever it is, um, to deliver really efficient, um, sustainable buildings that, that um, will be a great um, opportunity for, for lower income and, and middle income families to be able to benefit from that. Because the, the, their investment, as Dave said, the investments up front potentially, and then the savings are to the homeowners or the renters because they're getting the, the, the savings on the energy. Uh, over time, so there's some issues with with all of that. I think there's, there's just an there's an equity component yeah. to all of this that's, so that's I, important to keep track of. Then that's an I, MAPC issue, right? And so, okay, so what I have here is we have three, four items right now. We have the first one is modify zoning for ground mounted and rooftop solar system installation for commercial and municipal buildings. This includes heat pumps and energy efficiency systems, and then. Their ABC is under it. We can review those in a second. The second one is modify zoning for rooftop solar installation for residential buildings. This includes heat pumps and energy efficiency systems. And there might be setbacks in there. Do you have the setback? Yes, you do. Okay. No, yeah, setbacks. Yes. So yeah. review, this one's review opportunity of sites, ease of permitting, and creating different fee structures. B, will need to create definition, setbacks, and approvals, review process, planning board, special permit, by right, et cetera. The C is review stormwater bylaw for recharging. So what changed down here is that we're not going to review opportunity for sites for, for residential buildings, you know, because. Multifamily may be part of the site issue. You know, when we start looking at assembling, um, you know, we've been discussing this with the housing plan working group that we want to have this inventory of, of private and public land that we can start to think about in the chestnut, in that whole corridor where we're gonna be able to combine sites and, and be able to create developable parcels of, of more meaningful size. So I think that's a that's where we might, the residential piece may come so in. We're gonna stay um, single family. We, we just wanna yeah, keep track of the two opportunities, single family lots and multifamily lots may be different. Yeah, because your basic residential home right now, we, we don't have any constraints about issuing solar systems for those. Multifamily may go in the upper one, actually. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I think it belongs. Yeah. yeah. Municipal okay. and yeah, and and, and you know, yeah, because then that's kind of they're all all larger site issues or okay. Or mm -hmm. more complicated. Okay, so then I'm gonna take out. Yeah. Um, this yeah. one here. 
So it's just, yeah. Single that, family, uh, so the, for this is single family, right? Yep. Residential buildings. Yep. Okay. So these are the two, two that seem really low hanging fruit. The third one is, the question that I have here is create town-wide town -wide master plan for climate strategies. Should, and then we have A, B, I have A, B, C, D, and F that I just started. As you guys are talking, I'm just writing this down with F having some other pieces. Should all of this be under number three or should, or do, do we want to pull out a couple I of I was D's? cherry picking. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you know, we might pluck the D, incentivize net zero homes and put that up as a D in, in number two. Right. I mean, it could be part okay. of the zoning. You know, right. Yeah. Okay. No, this is good. This is why I'm asking because I want to make it so that the what about the big house impacts? Like the, the well, that's I a know. that's a huge, that's a I mean, that's got all kinds of issues with it. That's got tree bylaw, that's got, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. stuff related to when you say big house impacts. I mean, that's you're talking about basically teardown issues, right? But that doesn't really go under number two, does it? No. Like, well, it's kind of its own thing. Um, well, I mean, if, if something's going to derail one of the other ones, we don't we want it to be its own thing. Well, I think the planning board looking at its regulations and requiring information on, resi on resiliency in terms of building design and site design from developers, I mean, can, can, can be a standalone. And that's a very, you know, we're asking for information on that. And articulating it as a goal. So that can be a, a standalone. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I guess, well, maybe we did talk about this. I mean, in Cambridge, I think starting in 2021 um, of buildings, I think over 25,000 square feet in size, they're requiring, you know, green roofs, um, um, a green roof area or, or, or a solar area. I mean, there's a um, an exemption out if, through a special permit process through the planning board, but for those larger buildings, they are actually requiring um, green roofs and the introduction of solar on the roof. How do we feel about that? Well, I think it's um, coming. Right? It's, maybe wait, it's, go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. I think they're saying 80% of their roofs have to be in that classification for buildings over 25,000 square feet, new construction. Right, and I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. So, for instance, I had a conversation with the uh, the people for uh, Children's Hospital, and we started talking about the generator and uh, the chilling units and all that. That's all going on the roof, so it's not on the ground. So once you start to put all this equipment on the roof, there's not a lot of roof left to go green roof. So you're either going to have yeah. green landscaping or you're going to have a green roof. Same thing with Muzzy. Same issues yeah. with lab. labs are intense. Okay. I mean, the, basically the entire roof is, yep. is, 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 a, is the mechanical systems. Yep. And I think it's a units, yeah. I think it's a conversation to have. You know, if we ever have that fourth um, hotel built, the perfect green roof opportunity there. I, the what? I just... Fourth? I just put coordinate this work with MBTA communities for the planning board. I think the planning board is a low hanging fruit also because we can look at amending these rules and regulations, right? Right. Separate than the master plan. The master plan is going to take longer. It's going to be, which is going to be great, but it's going to, um, I think, I think this, this in general reviewing, um, Put it in parking, I think, is, is transportation, parking and transportation or something. Yeah. Yeah. Parking and transit. Uh, maybe they're separate. Uh, I mean, I know we're going through this whole parking um, is an issue um, with the I, parking. I think, this yeah, parking I just want to make sure that we that we put them in, in pots that that can get approved separately and and, and, and we don't hold back, you know. Yep. Something so the one, are, I have one other issue, which was the GHG, you know, your greenhouse gas emissions, the inventory, taking the inventory, and then actually starting to come up with a structure for reporting, both on the commercial municipal and, and also on the residential side, although the residential side may be a little further out and, 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 and more challenging. But, I, but the, basically the whole, I mean, that's a huge, right, to have a... The, do the inventory of the emissions. I think that's being done or has been done, or there's some understanding of 
where we are with that. And I think there was a lot on, there's a small component of, of the municipal. And then there's a fair amount that's on the residential side that we we just have some rough numbers on. But Dave, you may, may know more about that than I do. But I think that's, so the idea is we challenge the community to set ambitious but achievable goals for 2050 on greenhouse gas, um, greenhouse gas um, reduction. Yeah. So, I, and I don't. I just don't know where we are relative to you know what's been done with CAPC and 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 Dave. You may know more. I would like to know more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but that's I think, this I master plan is going to take longer, and it's going to need resources, right? So the planning board amending rules and regulations for applications with information on this piece. Um, yeah, uh, they're, so they're telling us about how how resilient their design is. So we're collecting that information and we're putting right. it on the table as something that's going to be discussed. So, I mean, we don't have any standard minimum standards about what it has to look like, but at least we're putting it out there and requiring people to give us information on it, which I think raises right. the consciousness and awareness of the issue. And it will be more, rele more rele <laughs> relevant yeah. and certainly more um, acceptable as a requirement for commercial projects. Right. For municipal projects on the residential side, it's still probably. Um, I'd love yeah. to know more. Actually, I think what Dave's saying is true. I, I would love to know on our residential side what typical houses are doing. I mean, we know we've got, you know, our automobiles, and then we and that that's that's mostly probably what we're dealing with. But then you got a lot of systems, a lot of oil and gas heating systems we've got energy loss <laughs> um in our buildings so there's there's a lot of stuff to learn about our residential the residential side of this but that's an mapc is is a is big on this whole ghg inventory and and then communities establishing ambitious but achievable goals for 2050 yeah and there's there's one other monster we've we hit upon a couple of times, but I think it's got to go under big house impacts and that that is the tree by law. Yep. At some point we're going to have, we're going to have to create one and yes. it's, effect, it's affected <laughs> by there's a, there's commercial. A separate group. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Large yeah. house, large house review teardown, I think is in your big house impacts. I mean, that's the teardown syndrome yep. too. Yep. That's, that's yeah. Dave, we're, we're going to try and plug into, I'd love to talk to you more about this. I know we touched base on this a little bit. You were giving me some really startling numbers that the one that I keep, I keep telling people is that when you said that you had 75 to 80 teardowns a year and that, you know, close to 50% of those are basically houses that don't need to go in a dumpster. They're actually, you know, could easily be turned over. They're not structurally unsound or in really poor shape. So that, and that I, 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 that just blows my mind, you know, that we yeah. aren't able to make sure that those houses are actually going through more of an opportunity to be sold to people in the marketplace who want to buy a house. That's well, that's uh, that's different that's, than the climate action piece. No, no, no. Right? I know, I know, I know. We're yeah, crossing yeah. over here, but I'm just saying that's part of the the. Well, it's also environmental. I mean, it is climate action because it's environmental. Yeah, but but what I'm saying it, is that, th yeah, that's like it's egregiously I, environmentally um, right. out of whack to take throw fifty percent of your houses into a dumpster. It's ridiculous. Well, you you bring up a good point. And just quickly, Maine and New Hampshire are going to close down out of state um, trash um, construction debris because they've been they've been taking it all. So that's going to become an issue where, Good. you know, there's a couple, a couple of companies out there that pull this stuff apart and recycle everything that's in there. But then there are other companies that it gets buried right. or burnt. Well, so that's an interesting one. Well, we haven't really thought about that. But if you start making it incredibly expensive for these guys to take down a house, the incentives... Uh, I don't know. We don't. We have to solve it today. The but thing, that's... Oscar, is that some people, some people, this is their lifeline, right? Like, I mean, this is their... They're developers. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, come on. This balance of like, I do not buy that we have to knock a house down 
because no, I, I agree with you, but but you can't just basically say make it so that they never tear any house down, right? Like, no, I know. I'm just saying we have to make have, it. I'm a, a balancing serious, you out right now a little bit. We have to. We have to. <laughs> we, have to, we, have to we, we want to make the calculation a little different, let's say. Yeah, I think um, I have here. So that's number five: big house impacts, right? Tree bylaw, storm water, electrification of systems, town resources, recycling and waste management, right? Um, passive house, right? Yep. So, yes. Um, so just these are the things. I think this one's going to, I mean, green roofs for new construction, that I feel could go up higher than, I mean, I think big house impacts is going to, we're going to get, it's, it's going to be a lot prickly, more prickly than others, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I'm putting yeah. it as number six. So I'm just trying to think of what's what's realistic, right, for us, seeing it's two o'clock. And so modifying yep. the zoning for commercial, municipal, multifamily, modify zoning for single family, planning board to coordinate with MBTA communities and, and CAPC work and and amend rules and regulations for applications with information on the following resilience, environmental, parking, transit, and transportation equity, create townwide master plan for climate strategies, and then green roofs for new construction is, is, you know, is another, I don't know if that is its own thing or if it goes into something else, but. It's probably another item on the floor, don't you think? Yeah. 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 And then the big house impact. So we basically, they, they've given us the task of coming up with with low hanging fruit and things that that take more time to develop and i think that this is a first start for us to yeah. think about it for the next month and figure and look at other examples and see i think it's a good start do you agree i would say yes. ghd yes. Uh, greenhouse inventory yes i like it but on your d 4d i just say ghg g okay sorry ghg yeah And the and, GHT inventory as well, inventory. not greenhouse greenhouse inventory. So it's a G, greenhouse gas inventory. So I'm going to have to get off here in a second. I got oh, a two o'clock. Yes, Dave and I both have that same two o'clock. <laughs> okay, so I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna circulate this as our as our meeting minutes. Um, Thank you. And I think this is great progress. To tell you the truth, I think the next thing that I want to do is have us review this, review it with other towns, and see what they do. But I also want to see if we can get, um, you know, someone from BR Plus A or someone to come review this with us. I'm thinking yes. of Jacob Knowles or Andrea Love or someone like that or Cape Brisky. Come in and review it with us and let us know what they think. Yeah. Yes. And that, and then we can we can share it with them. And then our work is done temporarily until we get the task of doing these. You know, when we talk to the larger group um, in January. Sounds okay. good. Okay, Thank Dave, you. we'll see you in the next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.